Cheers guys, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Pancast. In the old Pancast today, we are going to talk rare whiskeys. Uh, some Pappy Van Winkle, we're gonna talk red meat, some reverse searing, uh, some carbon steel tips. We've got a new series of pans from Debouillet, gonna take a first look at and more. Let's jump in and get started. Pappy Van Winkle. This is not Pappy Van Winkle, but it's still pretty good stuff though. If you're unfamiliar with Pappy Van Winkle, it is a rare high demand bourbon whiskey uh, made in very small batches, very expensive and very hard to find. Um, a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle at retail can sometimes go for three to $400 but because it's in such high demand, you can't even find it on store shelves. There's a secondary market for the whiskeys. On the secondary market, they can go for over $5,000 a bottle. I live in the state of Utah. Um, you can buy normal, regular beer, your Coors Light type beer at gas stations, at grocery stores, but wine and liquor and what they call heavy beer, that's your, seven, eight percent IPAs, that really uh, high alcohol beer, that is all sold at state liquor stores. Um, the Pappy Van Winkle would of course be also sold at state liquor stores. And what I heard used to happen a few years back, I don't know if this is true or not, but um, I heard when we were going to get our state's allotment of Pappy Van Winkle and some other uh, high demand products, Lots of times that would never even hit the store shelves. Either the employees might buy it or they might let their friends know, be here on such and such a date when the doors open because all of a sudden the Pappy Van Winkle is gonna be on the shelf. So it was all gone. And what they decided to do was implement a lottery or a drawing system. So you go to the Utah DABC website, you register and they put your name in for a drawing for the right to buy these high demand products. And it's kind of interesting here in Utah, they kind of tell you your odds of winning. They tell you what all is coming in. And for example, for the latest drawing coming up this week, I just registered for this, uh, the Pappy Van Winkle 23 year old uh, whiskey. Uh, we're getting five bottles in retail price, 400 bucks each. That's the one I looked up on the internet on the secondary market going for well over $5,000 each. Um, some other stuff coming in, several other Pappy Van Winkles, some Thomas Handy Rye, some Sazerac Rye, some Old Van Winkle Rye, and it tells you your odds of winning over here. So for that Pappy Van Winkle 23 year old, there are 9,260 people registered currently, and there are five bottles that gives you 0.05% chance of actually winning the right to buy a bottle. As a great philosopher once noted, so you're telling me there's a chance. I will point out, however, that this does seem to be a little bit like the old Soviet Union when people used to line up for their allotment of bread, and if there was not enough bread for everyone, you were just out of luck. Or it could be kind of like America with a toilet paper shortage during a recent pandemic. But if there is not enough to go around at the list price, you will have lines. And what I propose to do here is, I'm just throwing this out here, not trying to be too political, maybe take half of our allotments for some of these high demand products and have the drawing. It would be fair, everybody would have a, a, an equal chance at uh, winning the right to buy a bottle. Maybe take the other half though and sell them at auction. Um, make it more free market. And it's odd to me that politicians, I mean, they run the state liquor stores, they're leaving a lot of money on the table here. If we have some tech billionaires around here, and I know we do, um, you know, people own the Utah Jazz, the Larry H. Miller Company, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of rich people in Utah who might pay five, $6,000 a bottle for this whiskey, that money could go for a scholarship, a teacher's salary, fix some potholes, who knows? But it would be kind of nice if we had fair for a fair and kind of random for a certain set and free market and get the full value going into the state's coffers for the other half. Who knows? No one asked me. Let's talk about the new series of pans from Debouillet. 
and um, I'm going to spell it. Uh, the name of the pens is L-O-Q-Y. And what they are is a series of pens that have removable handles. And these are really targeted at people who have a severe lack of storage space. So if you're in a McMansion in the suburbs of an American city, probably not that big of a deal. You might not be interested in them. If you're in an apartment the size of a supply closet in New York or a big American city, these might be really welcome additions to the lineup. Now, the first thing I asked them when I heard about these is how do you pronounce it? Um, I started covering Debouye pans about four years ago. And for the first year, I was calling them Debuyer. And um, I subsequently talked to them and learned how to pronounce things correctly. Uh, a little bit embarrassed about mispronouncing that early on. Then again, um, if you have a low embarrassment threshold, you shouldn't be doing a YouTube channel to begin with. So not that big of a deal. But I learned to pronounce it Debouye. Also, their copper pans, I learned to pronounce those Inoquivra. Uh, very difficult to pronounce these are pronounced lock e as in l o c k dash e e lock e um, i thought it might be low key but that's not right but that is how you pronounce them and what this allows you to do is detach the handles from your pans to save on storage space uh, they've got kind of the cast stainless steel fancier french type handle you can get they also have these uh, wooden handles you might want if you're using something like a stock pot. So I have ordered these. I have not actually used them yet, but hopefully they'll come in the next few days. We'll do a deeper dive when they come in, but they should be fairly interesting. Um, what I also find uh, where I want to get a little bit more information, is this going to be its own collection in an entire series of pans, or is this going to be an option on some of the other pan series? Because I noticed what they've launched with is the uh, mineral bees you can get the locky system on the, those a couple of the uh, alchemy pans which are st stainless steel those are the um, three ply stainless steel and then also on some of their non-sticks but around here we don't focus too much on the non-stick stuff so it'll be interesting to see i ordered the mineral bee frying pan so it's going to be interesting to see if i can flip an egg with this new locky detachable handle system and I don't want it to detach halfway through flipping an egg. So we're going to do a little testing on that and see when they come in. And of course, there's a link below if you want to check out more information on that new Locky system. Velo Siped 135 wrote in and said he found a good deal on all clad D3s, a seven piece set at Macy's. And there are apparently some incentives. Uh, if you sign up for a newsletter, you get a, an additional discount. And he saved a couple hundred bucks, saved 200 bucks on those pans. So if you're looking for some D3s, you might want to check out Macy's and uh, see what they have on offer. Uh, the Mapfer new model pans, still waiting on the latest update from Mapfer on those. Um, in the meantime, P. Daniels 165 wrote in and said he's been using his Mapfers for a couple of years now and loves them. He purchased a 12 and 5 8 inch a few months ago and got the newer model. So it looks like the 12 and 5 8 inch newer model on that size. He also ordered a 10 and a half inch pan and got the old model. So whether you get the new model or the old model, it may just depend on which size pan you are ordering. And he finishes up with either model performs excellent. So he likes either model, the new or the old. Let's see, Brocula. 1312 wrote in and asked, can you cook acids like tomato or lemon in carbon steel pans? Uh, this is something people will need to know early on when they're new. You cannot. That acid will eat away at your seasoning. And if it eats all the seasoning off, it can also react a little bit with the metal and give your food a little bit of a metallic taste. So no uh, acidic foods in your carbon steel. And that's not only uh, lemon and tomatoes. That's also sometimes wine can be fairly acidic. Sometimes even onions can be acidic. Um, the things that you know specifically, tomatoes, vinegar, lemon juice, that stuff, definitely other foods like those onions, you may have to just try them a time or two and see how it goes. But nothing terribly acidic in your carbon steel. Brent Rose wrote in about sliding eggs in carbon steel skillets, which we've done in several videos. He says he loves butter, but recently he's gotten into using avocado oil for his fried eggs. 
Um, he says, I know oil doesn't crackle the way butter does. Is there an oil version of the butter test? And here, what he's talking about is in the video where I showed how to slide eggs in a carbon steel skillet, I use butter. And when that butter stops bubbling and crackling, that's when I add the egg. Is there a test for the, a similar test for using avocado oil? I actually don't know of one. In here is what you're, what you're gonna have to do is just practice a few times and get your timing down so that you know. So you might burn one early on, one might be too cool, but just uh, set a timer and uh, learn when to add the egg if you're gonna use that avocado oil instead of butter. He also asks, if after you fry your eggs, you don't see any food particles left over and the oil isn't burned, is it okay to leave the oil in there overnight and use it again? Um, I don't think there's any problem with leaving oil overnight in a carbon steel. It might actually be good for it, who knows? Um, what you want to avoid is leaving that oil too long because oil will just naturally become rancid and sticky if you leave it too long. Uh, if you're gonna use it the next morning, might be okay. If you skip three or four days, eh, it might be a little gross, who knows. But I don't see anything wrong with trying it. I don't think it's going to mess anything up as far as the carbon steel pan goes. Let's see, Jay Stones, 9872 writes in and says, Hi Scott, I am wondering if you have any thoughts on pressure cookers. I am thinking of getting the Fissler six quart with steamer as he tackles the Heston Blumenthal at home cookbook. Um, I'm kind of an old school pressure cooker guy myself. I have a Fissler as well. The, uh, I think it's an eight quart and I've really enjoyed mine. There are a lot easier pressure cookers to use on the market these days, some of these instant pots, but I am kind of an old fuddy duddy and I don't mind the old school Fissler um, pressure cooker. I use it quite a bit for, especially for cooking uh, dried beans. It really speeds up the process there. And I recently used it for some uh, Cuban uh, pork. Actually really good in the old Fissler. So Fissler gets a thumbs up. Newark, New Jersey. Recently flew into Newark. As some of you who've been around the channel for a while know, I have some relatives kind of in rural New Jersey and I often fly from Salt Lake City to Newark Airport, which often leads to my Newark face. And if you've ever flown Delta into B Terminal at Newark, you know exactly what I am talking about. You know, someone once said it's very important to make a good first impression. That person was not in charge of Newark. <laughs> Regardless though, as much as I criticize, I have to praise when it is warranted. Delta no longer flies into B terminal, they're flying into A terminal. A terminal is new, only about a year old, and I think they're tearing B terminal down, thank goodness, um, and not a moment too soon. But actually A terminal was Fairly nice. Believe it or not, absolutely almost first world. So if you find a Newark and get to go to A terminal, you're doing a lot better than you used to be. And I bring Newark Airport up uh, because I want to segue into talking about some delicious meat. Uh, I've got to go to New Jersey and stay on my in-laws farm. Uh, my wife, son and I went a couple of weeks ago and it's fairly idyllic out there. You don't really think of farms when you think of New Jersey, but out in the countryside, it's very nice. There are sheep and goats, some pigs living high on the hog. And I do hear that they may have one bad day somewhere around the holidays. But also my father-in-law pours a lot of scotch, gives me lots of cigars and also cooks these. Holy cow, pun intended. Um, if you're ever around Califon, New Jersey and need some delicious meats, I know Wendy's always says, say, says they have the meats. Uh, there's a store in Califon, New Jersey called Rambo's where my father-in-law shops quite often. And he got these delicious ribeyes there. These are over two inches thick. And the way he cooked these is a reverse sear. Now I don't usually do reverse sear myself but he uh, put these in the oven and uh, let them warm up to, I think he said 130, 131 degrees. And that took, um, took a while, well over an hour. And in the meantime, we had uh, plenty of time for some scotch. And then he seared the heck out of these guys. He actually slathered them with Amish butter, then over a lot, two chimney fulls of uh, hot charcoal. And these things turned out fantastically. You got nice pink edge to edge. 
and you get that sear on the outside, absolutely delicious. So I'm still not a big fan of sous vide. However, reverse sear, I am going to give a thumbs up to. Cheers to that. We also cooked about 10 feet uh, fresh made pork sausage with some uh, peppers and onions in there. Also made at that Rambo store. Uh, not a sponsor by any means, but if you're near California, New Jersey, and want some delicious meat, definitely check out Rambo's. Pretty cool name to get on a, a t-shirt too. Let's talk a little bit about Kamado Joe. Now is a good time of year to shop around for year end clearance sales on Kamado Joe's. I got mine last year. Um, list price on these things is usually 12, 1300 bucks. I got the Kamado Joe Classic too, but I found one on a, a closeout in the season sale unadvertised at my local Costco for about 600 bucks. So if you shop around, there's a chance you can snag a screaming deal this time of year on Kamado's. Um, I did some ribs over the weekend. And one thing I want to show about this uh, Kamado Joe Classic too, I have the 18 inch model. I got ribs also at Costco, and there were three slabs in the pack. Uh, on the 18 inch, you cannot lay out three entire slabs of ribs. They just won't fit on there. Admittedly, a first world problem here. You have to cut them up to get them to fit, but everything turned out quite nicely. Also those Kamados, just like any other grill, they get a lot of gunk built up in there. What I've started doing is, um, when I, once I take the ribs off, there's still a fair amount of charcoal left in there open all the vents and let that kind of burn everything off. The temperature will really spike up. And if you burn everything off, you can kind of get the ceramics where you can at least see that original white color again. Uh, do that. And then I got out the old uh, leaf blower and blew all the dust out and good way to clean the old Kamado. The t-shirts I showed in the last pan cast actually sold several of those. So uh, people are liking the Uncle Scott's merch. Some more designs will be on the way. Make sure you check those out. Check the links for that new Debouye system below. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Pancast.